Barack Obama's been president for six years. What has he done to stop racism? I don't got nothing good no. to say about we're, the president. We're, we're, what has Barack Obama done to help the black people in America? Uh, I don't know. We don't know. Well, what's he done for you? What's he done for you? Nothing. Not a thing. <laughs> You were down in the eye of the storm, then, man. That's true. I, I was, I was kind of right there in the thick of everything. If I had, you were a paramedic on the on the fire department. I'm just putting some context for the audience. Right, right. So, so yes, in my in my civilian job, I work full time as a paramedic firefighter. And then, in um, my experience with this particular situation was with uh, was uh, being a soldier and, and a combat medic with the North, the National Guard. So it all kind of centered in a particular area of Baltimore, but th there was a couple hot spots and. Um, I actually pulled pull shifts at um, most of those places. Let me ask you a question. What is the morale of the first responders and the, and the firemen and the cops? I mean, it just seems to be the most impossible situation right now. There's, like, no winning. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, damned double if you do. It's just crazy. How do you work under those conditions? So, so you kind of have these um, these three sectors of what people commonly think about as, as public servants or, or maybe as public safety, and that is the police department, the fire department slash EMS, and then the military. You know, what the public saw was we saw bricks being thrown. We saw cr just cr crazy stuff, even involving firefighters who were pretty much just coming in to try to right. put out the right. flames, I'm assuming. I mean, I don't know if they were using you in any right. other capacity. But. Um, I had the least amount of experience. Actually, I had no experience, really, with um, firsthand with the fire department while I was there. Um, we worked there. We interacted with the police on a daily basis, though. On the police end, certainly, you know, I, I had, I spoke for several hours when we had a little bit of downtime with two two police officers in particular, one, one of them a, a white police officer, one of them a black police officer. Um, I, I told them, I, I said, man, I really feel for you guys because I feel like, you know, is anyone ever gonna respect you in this neighborhood again? Because well, people were walking by and, and I mean, just saying the most, like, hateful things you can imagine about police officers. You know, I was trying to get their perspective on it. They were kind of far enough into their careers that they really couldn't go anywhere else. You know, one, one sure, gentleman had sure. 23 years on the job. The other gentleman had uh, 10 years on the job. And... Um, and, and so they're not going to go anywhere. You know, they're, they're, they got to stick out their, their jobs for their for families and their careers right. and their retirement right. and everything. Right. But, but they said, you know, the big thing I took out of the conversation with them is they said, you know, they, uh, the precedence has been set now right. that if you're a police officer, you, you will get in trouble if, mm -hmm. if you try to do your job and arrest the criminal. That mm -hmm. That is – the image to, that has been sent to the police department, you know? So what they said is, they said, you think crime is bad in this city now? They said, wait, wait, wait until after all this and after we all go back on our normal schedules. And they said, you're, you're going to see cops driving right by crimes being committed and not do anything about it. Right. Because right. they're scared they're going to get in trouble. Here's an interesting point. Who is that going to hurt most? The most impact of that will come in East, inner city, minority families, lower socioeconomic families will take, again, another bloody lip, so to speak, by right. in, incoherent and emotive, cowardly, quite, quite frankly, cowardly from the leadership, save your butt policies, you know, just throw everybody right. under the bus, uh, everything politi politically motivated, nobody stepping up and doing the right thing. Because, I mean, I've been thinking about the fallout from this thing on many different fronts. You know, obviously you're thinking, gosh, a cop, like what motivation does he have to step up and do nothing? You know, there's no motivation. There's no motivation right. to do any of that. Even on a macro level, think about this. What about the, the precedence this sets for any kind of vigilante person with some sort of gripe? It's, it's very similar to the Middle East. Right now the dog's off the chain in the Middle East. The evil is just running rampant because the United States has been uh, proven itself to be a capitulator. With evil. Well, are we right. not doing that in our own American cities? So, so what's to keep the KKK or any other fanatic group that thinks they have some sort of grievance, whether it's true or not, to just riot, burn down property, harm people? You know, may, maybe the beginnings of that were, are already in the making. Um, you know, when we were down there, 
I mean, this is obviously a neighborhood that is that's already riddled with crime. You know, when I was in, in the streets up at Pennsylvania and North Avenue, you know, where which is kind of like ground zero for this event. It's, you know, where the CVS burned down and everything. That, that particular area is already uh, gang infested. You know, there's the Crips, there's the Bloods on top of, you know, all these other people like just trying to stir up emotions about about this whole present situation. Literally, like, the gang members were showing their colors, throwing gang signs at us. There's all these different kinds of groups of people, none of them up to any good. You know, mm-hmm. already kind of competing for territory, and and then the police department whose hands are tied, and and who uh, now have less motivation to to try to do the right thing. You know, very interesting dynamic. You know, on, on top of and I think you commented about some of this. You know, it's you know these people are, are their own worst enemy. You know, mm-hmm. they I remember mm-hmm. standing in front of the CVS. And, and looking at this burned down CVS or, or partially burned down CVS and thinking to myself, th- th- these people, when they rioted, they came in and they burned their own neighborhood down. Right. <laughs> like, right. This, this is so counterproductive. Like, and that, that particular neighborhood is already what they, what they call a food desert, you know, where there's no, there's almost no restaurants or places to get food. You know, I think I saw one little, market you know it was so small i can't imagine what they even sold in there and there was a subway and i think that was the only sources of food i saw and i think it's appropriate exactly and i think it's an appropriate time to say that when we have these conversations you know you hear terms like food doesn't roll off the lips of mrs michelle obama but they never put into context well why would that be well maybe it's because businesses have no motivation to open up businesses in store in stores and, and and entrepreneurial endeavors in neighborhoods that, that have a 50-50 chance of getting burned to the ground. And, and by the way, th- those things, those kind of conversations never get had. Of course, it's not sexy. It's not going to win you any elections. But uh, well, all mm-hmm. those conversations would be had if you cared about people. You know, that was one of the things that struck me about this whole thing, Rob. And since you got to go down there and see it, it must have been so moving. You know, all this rhetoric from the talking heads and the trust fund babies on TV, and they all went to Ivy League, and they're, they're poo-pooing and condescending these neighborhoods, and it's, it's, it's a cop, and it's endemic racism, and it's societal problems. And you know what, what, I, what I realized is they never live down there. They have no skin in the game. They're, all they're doing is seeing what they think the moment uh, is asking for to en- enrich themselves, empower themselves, and they're all going to be gone to the next thing. And these neighborhoods will be left in ruin. The 60% absentee rates at the schools will continue. And the, and the poor mm. African American culture will continue to be condescended to like some sort of school child. And, and, and this, is, this is just running rampant. So throw, throw everybody under the bus, right? You got the cops, you yep. the problem. Society is the problem. Some white guy that has never stepped foot in that town is the problem. But the, the Democrats running that city, they're not the problem. The, 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 the right. black culture isn't the problem. And, and to this day, those conversations aren't had. I was struck by the irony of the headline where they were arresting officers. Now, I'm not even speaking to their guilt or innocence. I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I'm not going to presume things I don't know. It, I, mean, mm-hmm. I saw a picture on the same broadcast. This is a real moment for me. So the broadcast had, you know that kid, he had his arms out real wide. He was almost like bathing in the smoke and the fire of the streets. Did you see that photo? It was a very mm-hmm. iconic photo. So that guy, right, no, no handcuffs, uh-huh. no arrest. While, while he stands over arson as some little old woman is peering out her window terrified of the country that she now lives in, right? No arrest me. And in the same broadcast, we got six cops with charges so laundry list long that I can't even keep them straight. I don't even... They threw the book at these guys, I, I think, just so they can get something to stick. But right. I just can't. I was so struck by the irony of that. I was so struck by the irony of that, that here we have a blatant crime. It's not, it's not ambiguous. It's not a matter of opinion. Mm. And we just live in a completely upside down world. And I mean, it's just, it's a wild thing to witness. It's just, it's absolutely wild. So, so sure. what we constantly hear, there is this huge, huge racial problem between law enforcement and uh, the black community. And you, you actually have a lot of experience, at least by way of the fire department and civil service. How much truth that is there? And is that just sort of a scapegoat, in your opinion? Just because 
it is true that that black culture needs to look in a mirror, and it is true that Democrats have been ruining that city fiscally and otherwise. That doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a problem between African Americans and the cops. And so that's kind of like what I'm asking you. You know, you don't you, just because one thing is true doesn't mean the other thing isn't true. And I'm just curious about it. I think it's a good question. And and you know, to to go back to what I was saying about the conversation I had with the one black police officer and the one white police officer. Um, I, I can tell you this, that for, from the police officer's standpoint, th- those guys both had the exact same view of the situation, that their fellow police officers, that all these charges that had been thrown at them were, were not accurate, they were not valid. They both thought that the problems in this city were due to the leadership in the city. They, they both um, spoke out against the leadership in the city. They said that the the people of of that particular area just kind of had no desire to want to help themselves. That's valid to see from from both of those races that work in the same department. And, so, um, you know, I, I think most of it is misinformation, uh, and kind of what you were alluding to, per- probably purposefully fed to these people, and um, and lack of education. Because I tell you, there were people. These people had no idea why they were um, why they were riding, why they were um, walking through the streets with their signs, why they were honking their horns, because we would have people in some of the more peaceful areas would honk their horns as they drove by as kind of like a, hey, it's the military, we support you, you know. But then people up up at, especially at um, at some of the kind of ground zero type location like a pen and north where um people were coming by and honking their horns for everything there was a guy who for hours and hours in the street just walked through this intersection like raising his hands in the air trying to get people to honk their horns and i'm 100 percent convinced they had no idea i think some people were honking because they were pro-military i think some people were honking because they hated the cops i think some people were honking <laughs> just because they wanted to fit in you know people had no idea what was going on they were just this guy was just able to create this situation where everybody was honking their horns it was giving it was so much it was giving like everyone headaches because it was non-stop honking for hours <laughs> So, so what does this leave us? What does this leave us then moving forward, by way of of that city and and where things sit? I mean, you know, do you see any silver lining? Do you see? I mean, you know, we hear about all this this talk of uh, awareness and stuff like that. I'm very, very skeptical. You can probably hear it in my voice, but I wasn't there. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it, again, uh, it might be my faith, or it might just be the practical way I look at the world. But more than even being right or wrong, I want to know, like, like, is this going to accomplish anything? Are we going to move in any particular direction? And, and from what you can tell, I mean, where, where, where does this leave the city of Baltimore, a city that I enjoy going to, a city that, that you know, sure. you and I grew up going to together? As, as, and, and then the people that live there and the actual human, human beings that got to raise their kids there. I mean, do you... I guess my question is, is, is any, is, is, is that, say that question one more time. Do you, is, 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 do you see a silver lining? Do you see any of this being special in any way? Or? No, no, definitely not. And, and, and the, the police officers I talked to, uh, felt that way. Uh, all of my fellow service members felt, feel that way. The, you know, the police officer said this, this will do nothing that has been done in the past. A uh, week and a half, or however long it's been now, um, days are kind of start, starting to blend together for me. <laughs> but the, uh, um, that they said crime rates are sure to go up. And they said they were very confident about that. So as far as crime goes, uh, that's going to that's going to be negatively affected in the city. Um, this is one more reason, you know, in, in a city, Baltimore, any city, it is is not exempt from the policies of the state either, just like every state is not totally exempt from the policies of the federal government. So Maryland in particular already has a huge problem with businesses fleeing from the state due to high taxes, right? So if you combine the the high taxes in the state and businesses already fleeing with the, the crime and riots and the potential for your city to get burned to the ground in Baltimore, there is no chance 
no chance business is going to come into that city. So you're going to have no money. You're going to have high crime. You're going